Hi guys, here we are back uh, for one final lesson before the uh, Unit 4 essay, which these, uh, these um, I guess, including today, these past seven lessons have been kind of building toward. Uh, remember that Unit 4 is all about exploring the power of descriptive language and figuring out what descriptive language allows us to see and interpret uh, within uh, especially creative writing. So like we've been looking at the openings of different novels, for example, and, and making predictions about how imagery, <coughs> excuse me, and word choice help us understand the characters and the settings within those novels. Um, so this will be one final lesson and then the, the essay test will be the last thing that we do as a class. Um, so we're going to continue working with the word list um, that we uh, that I kind of introduced to you last time. We we did an example with uh, with a different word list, and then your your previous um, practice was to take the word list from the story, all the light we cannot see, and kind of make predictions based on those diction choices. Um, today we're going to build off of that and we're actually going to look at the uh, excerpt from All the Light We Cannot See and expand it from just looking at those diction choices to also looking at the imagery and figuring out what the diction and imagery tell us about character and setting. We'll also finally take one last look at how all of that helps us develop a thesis and plan an essay uh, that we could write about the selection. You'll have some practice and that should set you up nicely for the essay, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end of this uh, at the end of this lesson. So let's get started. All right, so this looks similar to what I did in the previous lesson, but it's a new set of words, which you should at this point have seen because the practice from the last lesson had this exact set of words. So we were talking just uh, in terms of interpreting diction, just to get a little extra practice at, at being able to pick out those really specific words that might tell us something. Um, the question that we should have been asking ourselves is, number one, how can we categorize these words? So your job in the previous lesson was to take or in the previous practice was to take this list of words and categorize it into at least three categories and kind of make predictions about what those words might be telling us about uh, the characters and the setting in the, in the story. So um, because I'm making this lesson before I've seen that work, um, I am not able to say exactly how you categorize them, but you should be thinking about how you categorize them as I go through how I'm, you know, how I'm categorizing them here in a second. Think like, are there similarities or are there differences? Certainly, my version of categorizing these words is not the only way that they could be categorized, and my predictions are not the only predictions that could be made. Um, but it's one way to do it. So you just compare your work to mine and see like how close did you get. So I did break it down into three categories. Uh, the first category that I broke it down to was uh, a category about bees. There seemed to be a lot of words that kind of implied bees and hives, um, you know, that kind of busyness, buzzy nature of, you know, bees going about their work. So um, I, uh, have those words here in red, monarch, hum, her majesty, hive, worker bees, queen, swirl, drone, all of them kind of implying that kind of bee, uh, beehive um, state of, you know, um, um, activity, I guess. And, uh, you know, some of it's a little bit figurative, such as monarch and her majesty, but you can imagine that you know, we, there are queen bees, right? So, um, so maybe maybe this is something about that. So, 
Um, but I really kind of want to focus on just that these words really get us uh, a sensation of like bustle and work and, you know, this just kind of constant movement and, and all of that. Um, another category that I noticed uh, was uh, words that implied the sensation of blindness. Um, so those are in purple. Um, I, I uh, chose cane, sightless, obviously, and braille. Um, so, you know, I looked at those and I said to myself, well, you know, this might tell me something about, you know, a character uh, or the character that's in the reading um, and that possibly a character will be unable to see or that it could be symbolically talking about, since we're talking about possibly like a hive of people, that these people are blind to something, that they're unable to, to perceive something. So that's possible as well. The last category that I um, uh, categorized uh, these words into were, were uh, wartime air battle vocabulary. So I was able to kind of link a bunch of these words to not just war in general, but but specifically, you know, wars fought with with airplanes. So, um, you know, some of them are not that specific, but I was able to narrow it down to there. So we've got ramparts, German, the Channel, Revolution, mortars, leaflets. Uh, if you don't know what leaflets are, they're um, often dropped by airplanes uh, to you know, kind of tell people about you know, who's dropping the bombs and things like that. We've got artillery, which often is fired up at airplanes. Bombardier is, is a, you know, bombing plane. The channel uh, tells us a little bit about the setting, which I'll get to in just a second. So uh, what, what this tells me is that it heavily implies strategy from World War II in Europe like strategies that were used in World War II. We've obviously got, you know, some specific references to countries, so that helps us narrow it down, but also it helps us understand the types of air battles that were being fought over those countries. So if you're historically aware, you would kind of know that. Um, I also wondered if this has connection to bees. I mean, bees fly. Um, sometimes bees are seen as kind of an army, uh, you know, like, like they can band together and work together and, you know, do, do things like that. So I thought maybe there was a connection there. Now, the last thing that I noticed was I still had a couple of words left over. Um, I had paper and ink, cartwheels, and I wasn't quite sure what to do with those. Um, so what I did was I kind of basically just created a fourth category and I just said, look, like there's this, this imagery of paper. Um, and I included cartwheels in that because if you think about the way that paper falls from the air and we're talking about flying and things like that, leaflets, uh, that, you know, possibly that this is, this is falling paper. Uh, so why would there be falling paper? You know, it, it connects to the leaflets, I think, but I'm not quite sure. What does that have to do with all the other action that could possibly be going around? So I take all of this information and I make a prediction, which was your job to do the same. So based on the way that I've categorized these words and what I've noticed about these specific diction choices, I start to wonder about the, the, uh, the setting and the characters, and this is what I predict for them. Using what I have noticed about these specific diction choices, I think they imply that the setting of the story will be in Europe during World War II, possibly in a busy military base, and that a character will be blind. Perhaps they are a writer. I probably should have added something about air battles. Um, that's just really my mistake. You know, it will be in Europe during World War II, during an air battle, possibly an air military base or an air base. Um, uh, that there will be a blind character, perhaps that blind character is a writer, I'm not quite sure. So that is my prediction. Now, is it accurate? Is it not accurate? I don't, you know, I don't know. 
so our next job is to see how accurate were we. So if you can turn to the student reader, uh, we're going to be reading pages 18 to 21. That's available on Canvas, uh, digitally on Canvas. This is an excerpt from the book, All the Light We Cannot See. Um, and it's slightly longer than the other excerpts that we've that we've read. Um, uh, but you'll bear with me. A few things that we should be on the lookout here for. So how correct were the predictions that we made based on the diction choices? So I'm specifically going to be looking for just the correctness of my prediction that this is taking place at an air base, that it's in, you know, uh, in Europe during World War II, that there's a blind character who's possibly a writer. How correct was I? Uh, second, what imagery supports our correct predictions from the diction? So I specifically want to be looking now for not just any imagery, but I really want to be looking for the imagery that confirms my predictions or at least builds from my predictions. So I will be highlighting, I'll be trying to remember to do this, to highlight imagery that confirms my predictions in yellow. And you should also be on the lookout for those as well. Like where does imagery confirm the predictions that you made from the diction? Uh, lastly, I should be considering what I might expect from the rest of the story. This is just the beginning of the full book. So what would I expect from the rest of the story based on the diction and the imagery Excuse me. that I've noticed? Uh, so I will read this out loud, uh, and then we will review it, and you'll have a little bit of practice to do. This is ex an excerpt from All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. 7th of August, 1944. Leaflets. At dusk, they pour down from, they pour from the sky. They blow ac across the ramparts, turn cartwheels over rooftops, flutter into the ravines between houses. Entire streets swirl with them, flashing white against the cobbles. Urgent message to the inhabitants of this town, they say. Depart immediately to open country. The tide climbs. The mood hangs small and yellow. The moon hangs small and yellow and gibbous. On the rooftops of beachfront hotels to the east and in the gardens behind them, a half dozen American artillery units drop incendiary rounds into the mouth of mortars. All right, so I've got, I'm gonna highlight this piece of imagery here, American artillery units drop incendiary rounds. Incendiary means explosive rounds. So I've got this kind of explosive uh, imagery of the wartime. Uh, so I've, you know, that kind of helps me confront uh, or confirm one of my predictions there. Bombers. They cross the channel at midnight. There are 12, and they are named for songs, Stardust and Stormy Weather, and In the Mood and Pistol Pack and Mama. The sea glides along far below, spattered with countless chevrons of white caps. Soon enough, the navigators can discern the, the low moonlit lumps of islands ranged along the horizon. France. I've got a little bit more imagery here that I that I want. So uh, let's see the, this imagery of the sea gliding below, spattered chevrons and white caps tells us about the the uh, the flying the airplanes. You know the the airplanes crossing the channel. So the the channel itself is the the space between France and England. Uh, it's the, or the, the water between France and England. So these are obviously planes flying over it, so that helps me confirm the, the, that. Intercoms crackle. Deliberately, almost lazily, the bombers shed altitude. Threats of red light, threads of, of red light ascend from anti-air emplacements up and down the coast. Dark, ruined ships appear, scuttled or destroyed, one with its bow shorn away, a second flickering as it burns. On an outermost island, panicked sheep run zigzagging between rocks. I like this. Dark, ruined ships appear, destroyed, one with its bow. So this is more wartime imagery that kind of helps confirm this World War II. 
stuff. Inside each airplane, a bombardier peers through an aiming window and counts to 20. Four, five, six, seven. To the bombardiers, the walled city, the walled city on this granite headland, drawing ever closer, looks like an unholy tooth, something black and dangerous, a final abscess to be lanced away. So again, I've got, uh, let's see, the, the bombardiers, the drain looks like a this. So drawing ever closer, the city looks like it. So they're they're coming to bomb this city and this imagery kind of invokes the sense that they're going to be destroying it so more wartime imagery the girl in a corner of the city inside a tall narrow house at number four rue vauborel on the sixth and highest floor a sightless 16 year old named marie laurie leblanc kneels over a low table covered entirely with a model the model is a miniature of the city she kneels within and contains scale replicas of the hundreds of houses and shops and hotels within its walls. There's the cathedral with its perforated spire and a bulky old chateau de Saint-Malo and row after row of seaside mansions studded with chimneys. A slender wooden jetty arcs out from a beach called the Plague de, de Molle. A delicate reticulated atrium vaults over the seafood market. Minute benches, the smallest to largest the smallest no larger than apple seeds do the tiny public squares uh so let's see she i i should have imagery that she's blind um but you know at least at uh let's see sightless 16 year old kneels over a low table so i guess this imagery of her this this um, you know, picture of her kneeling over this table with this model of the city is what I'm what I'm really looking for to confirm that. Marie Lurie runs her fingertips along the centimeter wide parapet crowning the ramparts, drawing an uneven star shape around the entire model. She finds the opening atop the walls where four ceremonial cannons point to sea. Bastion, Bastion de Hollande, she whispered, whispers and her fingers walk down a little staircase. Rue de Cordier, Rue Jacques Cartier. Let's see, I'm gonna highlight her fingers walk down a little staircase. I'm also going to uh, finger uh, highlight this fingertips along the centimeter wide parapet drawing uneve an uneven star shape. This just kind of sensation that she's experiencing this model of the city so she's blind it's confirming that but she's experiencing this model of the city through touch that she can't see it but she can feel the the model of the city in a corner of the room stand two galvanized buckets filled to the rim with water fill them up her great uncle had taught has taught her whenever you can the bathtub on the third floor too who knows when we'll get when the water will go out again her fingers travel back to the cathedral spire, south to the gate of Dinan. All evening, she has, been, she has been marching her fingers around the model, waiting for her great uncle Etienne, who owns this house, who went out the previous night while she slept and who has not returned. And now it is night again, another revolution of the clock, and the whole block is quiet, and she cannot sleep. I'm going to do this, this marching her fingers around the model. That's a piece of imagery, I think, that helps confirm her blindness. So we've got that, um, you know, the sensation and this, maybe even the sound marching kind of military, militaristic, even though it's a model of that. She can hear the bombers when they are three miles away, a mounting static, the hum inside a seashell. I'm gonna highlight that as imagery of her blindness sound of you know hearing hearing the bombers as well as confirmation of this wartime stuff when she opens the bedroom window the noise of the airplane airplanes becomes louder otherwise the night is dreadfully silent no engines no voices no clatter no sirens no footfalls on the cobbles not even gulls just a high tide one block away and six stories below lapping at the base of the city walls and something else something rattling softly very close. She eases open the left-hand shutter and runs her fingertips up, up the slats of the right. A sheet of paper has lodged there. She holds it to her nose, 
It smells of fresh ink, gasoline maybe. The paper is crisp. It is it has been out it has not been outside long. So I'm gonna highlight this imagery, the smell and feel of the paper, kind of confirming her blindness. Marie Laurie hesitates at the window in her stocking feet, her bedroom behind her, seashells arranged along the top of the armoire, pebbles along the baseboards. Her cane stands in the corner, her big braille novel waits face down on the bed. The drone of the airplane grows. The boy. Five streets to the north, a white-haired 18-year-old German private named Werner Fennig wakes, oh, wakes to find a staccato hum, little more than a purr, flies tapping out of uh, a far-off window pane. Where is he? The sweet, slightly chemical scent of gun oil, the raw wood of newly constructed shell crates, the mothballed odor of old bedspreads. He's in the hotel, of course. L'Hotel de Abel, de, uh, the Hotel of the Bees. Oh, interesting. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, that kind of, I'm just going to circle that as it's, it's a little bit, it's not a military base, but he is a private. Uh, so that means he's in the military. Um, and I'm also going to highlight the, this, these smells uh, that he's getting, these of, of wartime kind of supplies, right? Like the gun oil and the, the shell crates, all of it is wartime. And then there's something, something about the bees here. Still night, still early. From the direction of the sea come whistles and booms. Flack is going up. Uh, so this more wartime imagery, the sound of uh, of the firing of the of the uh, anti-aircraft missiles. An anti-air corpor corporal hurries down the corridor, heading for the stairwell. Go to the cellar, he calls over his shoulder, and Werner switches on his field light, rolls his blanket into his duffel, and starts down the hall. Not so long ago, the Hotel of the Bees was a cheerful address, with bright blue shutters on its facade and oysters on ice in its cafe and Breton waiters in bow ties polishing glasses behind its bar. It offered 21 guest rooms, commanding sea views, and a lobby fireplace as big as a truck. Parisians on weekend holidays would drink aperitifs here, and before them the occasional emissary from the Republic, ministers and vice ministers and abbots and admirals, and in the centuries before them, Windberg and corsairs, killers, plunderers, raiders, seamen. Before that, before it was all, uh, before it was ever a hotel at all, five full centuries ago, it was the home of a wealthy privateer who gave up raiding ships to study bees in the pastures outside Saint Malo, scribbling in notebooks and eating honey straight from combs. The crests above the door lintels still have bumblebees carved into the oak. The ivy-covered fountain in the in the courtyard is shaped like a hive. Werner's favorite are five faded frescoes on the ceilings of the grandest upper rooms, where bees as long as children, as big as children, float against blue backdrops, big lazy drones and workers with diaphanous wings, where above a hexagonal bathtub, a single nine-foot-long queen with multiple eyes and a golden-furred abdo golden abdomen curls across the ceiling. Over the past four weeks, the hotel has become something else, a fortress. A detachment of Austrian anti-airmen has boarded up every window, overturned every bed. They have reinforced the entrance, packed the stair stairwells with crates of artillery shells. The hotel's fourth floor with garden rooms with French balconies open directly onto the ramparts has become home to an aging high-velocity anti-air gun called an 88 that can fire 21 and a half pound shells nine miles. Her Majesty, the Austrians call their cannon, and for the past week, these men have tended to it the way worker bees might tend to a queen. Ah, oh, okay. So I'm this this um I'm gonna highlight for the past week these men have tended to it. Uh, it is Her Majesty, uh, the way worker bees might tend to a queen. They've fed her oils, repainted her barrel, lubricated her wheels. They've arranged sandbags at her feet like offerings. So all of this kind of 
imagery of the way that these men are working around this gun, this giant gun, as if the gun is this worker bee queen. Kind of, I kind of sort of got the hotel slash military base thing. It's similar. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but lots of imagery of kind of bustling around the queen bee, which is the gun, uh, and the the way that they're they're treating her as something to be worshipped. The royal Acht Acht, a deathly monarch meant to protect them all. Werner is in the stairwell, halfway to the ground floor, when the 88 fires twice in quick succession. It's the first time he's heard the gun at such close range, and it sounds as if the top half of the hotel is torn off. I like that. It's wartime imagery. It helps confirm that. He stumbles and throws his arms over his ears. The walls reverberate all the way down into the foundation, then back up. Werner can hear the Austrians two floors up scrambling, reloading, and, recede and the receding screams of both shells as they hurtle above the ocean, already two or three miles away. Uh, I'm going to highlight this. It kind of confirms that, uh, that wartime imagery, as well as the hustle and bustle of the military kind of base that I predicted. One of the soldiers he realizes is singing. Or maybe it is more than one. Maybe they are all singing. Eight Luftwaffe men, none of whom will survive the hour, singing a love song to their queen. I'm going to highlight that because it confirms the that kind of beehive imagery, but also the war. Werner chases the beam of his field light through the lobby. The big gun detonates a third time and glass shatters somewhere close by and torrents of soot rattle down the chimney and the walls of the hotel toll like a struck bell. I'm going to highlight that. I really like that sound imagery of the walls reverberating like a bell, kind of getting that, that uh, wartime imagery there. Werner worries that the sound will knock the teeth from his gums. He drags open the cellar door and pauses a moment, vision swimming. This is it, he asks. They're really coming? But who, who is there to answer? All right. So now what I want to do, now that I've gone through and highlighted um, my different examples, and maybe you were following along and, and highlighting or at least taking note of different things that you could highlight on your own, or maybe you were just copying my highlights, what I'd like to do is just see how good were my predictions. So. I was correct. The setting is of Europe during World War II. I can, you know, I can confirm that with things like Luftwaffe and the fact that there's there's American bombers flying over the the French or the the English Channel. All of that historically, I'm able to confirm that. So I, I think I did a pretty good job, and I think I've got diction and imagery choices that would support that. Um, the setting, a, a military, busy military base, yeah, um, it's a hotel. It combines the idea of, of bees uh, and the worship of bees. I have some imagery and diction to support that, so I feel like I was pretty accurate with that. Uh, was there a blind character? Yes, there was a blind character, and her blindness does kind of play into uh, the, you know, the, the imagery that we get of her fingers kind of walking around the, this model of the city so we know that she knows the city and, and that the city's present in World War II France and all of that. So I've got imagery and diction choices that confirm that. Uh, the character as a writer, nothing confirmed that, however. So I was not correct about that. But lots of, the diction allowed me to make lots of really kind of fairly accurate um, uh, uh, predictions about what we would read in this selection, and then the imagery really helped to reinforce uh, the correct predictions and to build complexity and nuance into my correct predictions. So now that I've got a good selection of diction and a good selection of imagery that supports my predictions, what I can do is I can plan an essay that, um, that helps me expand upon what I've learned here. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is, well, I, that I've already done, but that I'm going to show you is how I've, I've now taken all of this information in and I've said, okay, here's what I 
could write an essay about for this, uh, for all of this uh, um, creative language that's used here. Um, so my thesis uh, says, since Anthony Doerr uses diction and imagery to create a hectic scene of destruction that puts the characters in danger, readers of this introduction may worry for their individual survival, but hope that they come together to support each other in the end. So what I've done is I've built off of these two, uh, or these many ideas that, that I found here. We've got imagery, we've got diction. That imagery and diction creates kind of this hectic scene of destruction and this worry for destruction that, that we know that these characters are in danger, that bombs are coming, you know, that bombs are, that, that artillery is being fired. Um, we've got this blind girl who, you know, she's off, in in her room uh we've got this this german boy who's about to be bombed into oblivion everybody's about to be bombed bombed into oblivion the diction and the and the imagery really kind of helps to support that so my my prediction then is is then that we should be concerned for their individual survival but i also know like why would why would we have been introduced to both of these people and so what i've done at the very end of this thesis is I've said, well, I hope that they can come together to support each other, that perhaps both of these people are our heroes and that, you know, the diction and imagery has really kind of set them up as uh, within those roles. And so uh, my kind of analysis or interpretation is that uh, this is all in setup for them to come together and work together to ensure each other's or try to ensure each other's survival. And that's all I'm really able to do with this, right? Like it's just a prediction, but I'm using that imagery, I'm using that diction to really kind of delve deep into this and say like, well, there's this sense of worry uh, for their well-being, and what can I, you know, what can I take from that? So I took that's what I took from this thesis, and now with the thesis, I know what kind of essay I need to write. So my basic essay outline is going to look like this. Again, um, it's basic and you could build beyond this. Obviously, this is not the only way that you could format an essay based on this thesis, nor is this the only thesis that you could possibly write here. Um, but this is what I've come up with. So based on the thesis that I wrote, I know that I would need to have an introduction paragraph. So uh, a hook with background information, uh, things like the author and the, you know, the setting and the book title and things like that. And then I would end that that essay, uh, sorry, that introduction uh, with my thesis, which you can see above. I have decided that I'm gonna split it into two body paragraphs. So the first body paragraph is going to be about diction and how diction creates that sense of destruction and danger, which then leads to uh, our uh, worry for the survival of uh, body paragraph two will do a very similar thing, except instead of diction, it will use imagery and talk about how the imagery creates that sense of destruction and danger and reinforces the sense of worry and survival for the characters. And I've obviously got plenty of evidence. I've got my diction list, which was provided for me in this case, but I could also have seen it on my own. You know, I could have found it on my own. I've got my my imagery highlighted so I can go back and pick imagery that's most appropriate for that. And I would expand upon the, the, all of that in my body paragraphs, making sure to tie back to my, my uh, thesis statement. And then in my final concluding paragraph, then I would build off of, well, what would I do with this information? So I would, you know, like I would then get to the final part of my thesis and you know how I may be hoping for the characters to come together and support each other in the end. Uh, and that would be my essay. Again, it's a basic essay outline. Uh, it's there, I think there is room for growth out of this outline, but this would do a pretty decent job. So you guys are going to practice this with a short, a much shorter reading uh, that, that will be elaborated upon in uh, in Canvas. So you'll go into the practice for Canvas. Uh, it'll tell you what to read and you'll basically walk yourself through this, um, this process one last time uh, as a final practice before we get to the final 
essay test for unit four, which will be uh, on the next day of uh, on the day of our our next lesson. Um, I want to say one last thing before I sign off. I know this has been a fairly long lesson, um, but it is the last one. So um, uh, that this all of this work is your final opportunity as well for you to show growth and improvement, especially if you're looking to raise grades. That we've been out of school now for you know, close to three months, um, and everything we've done has just been checking things off and you know submitting things for approval. You sh you've been getting feedback. Hopefully, you've been uh, looking at the way the ways in which I've been giving feedback, either as to the whole group or uh, you know to you individually. We've done many different things. We've done some reading, we've done some reflecting and writing, and you've uh, we've done some creative work on our own. You've written a story. We've done this work together and we've reviewed uh, a lot of things and learned a few things more. Uh, none of it has affected your grade, but if you are looking to improve your grade, then the best way to do that beyond having simply been engaged and showing that uh, you know you were keeping up with the work the best way to do that is to show now that these past three months have not been a waste and that when you do take this essay test that you have uh, internalized and are able to incorporate all of the ideas from what we've done since uh, since you know school shut down and even before and you've grown and you're showing yourself to be capable um, and uh, successful at uh, utilizing all of the things that we've learned throughout the year, including the things that we've learned over the course of the school shutdown. So if you are looking to improve your grade, this is the best opportunity that you're going to have to do it. The essay test will take place on my AP uh, and I will, uh, that that's the online resource and I will have more instructions for that on the day of the essay so until then make sure to practice and email me if you have questions and I'll see you on the other side